Welcome to the 32nd Annual Nebraska Data Users Conference from the Center for Public Affairs Research at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. To ensure that each of you have data resources you've come to expect, we've adapted the conference again to a series of events showcasing timely, accessible, and integral sources and applications of data that impact the lives of Nebraskans. In addition to updates and analysis of U.S. Census Bureau data products, this year will feature new applications and data, new data sources, and will host a diverse group of experts to help us make sense of Nebraska's changing demographics. As always, the Center for Public Affairs Research is deeply concerned with the important work you do in our communities. We look forward to hosting you throughout the data conference series and working with you throughout the year. I am going to be talking about uh, the current population survey. Uh, it is a data product that I don't know, I know for a fact has not been talked about in recent data, Nebraska data conference series or conferences. Uh, so I think it will be interesting to many uh, and definitely kind of new, uh, but I don't just want to talk about it because it's new. Um, this year has been different than many others and uh, sort of led me to wanting to talk about this with you all. So let me bring you on that journey first and it's probably a journey that many of you know and understand as well. If at any time during 2020, uh, someone asked me, how are you? I said, busy. I said, busy. And I think that's true for a lot of reasons. Uh, but I think the pandemic really shifted the demand for data in a way uh, that made CPAR um, as busy as we were. So I'll just take you on that journey quick before we jump in. Uh, we helped produce the COVID-19 Impact on Nebraska Businesses survey, two rounds of that survey. If you ever thought government doesn't do anything. Let me tell you, in the weeks leading up to that survey, we sure did. Uh, along with several university partners like the Nebraska Business Development Center and UNL, UNL's Business Center, uh, several of the Chambers of Commerce, as well as our Department of Economic Development and the Governor's Office, uh, right there uh, as COVID-19 is beginning to impact the state, there's just, this brief pause where everyone says, we need information about our businesses and what kind of impact this is gonna have on business. And we stepped right in to help produce the survey to understand that um, and glean some really great insights, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, things like this, which I'll go into more depth today, but this is just a screenshot from that report and if you, need to check out that report, I really suggest it. There is uh, depth of data in there produced right here in Nebraska, but we saw a disproportional uh, impact of COVID-19 across industries. And uh, compared to, let's say the Great Recession, that was different. Uh, it wasn't uh, a ubiquitous impact across all industries of the same magnitude. And we thought that was interesting and something that, um, our economic development ecosystem needed to understand. Uh, we also saw different impacts across the state. Another screenshot from that report. Uh, simultaneously with the COVID business surveys, uh, we work with the planning committee of the Nebraska State Legislature currently chaired by Senator Vargas. And he reached out really early and said, we need a tool to track the economy through the pandemic. And my goodness, I hope we're close to that recovery. Uh, and, you know, we know these data points that everyone uses, but they're not all in one place. Uh, you know, think about all the dashboards that were developed um, by the health and human sectors across the country to show uh, COVID-19 rates. And, the planning committee really asked that we had something like that to focus on the economy. So as Melanie in the last session presented, we created that Nebraska Economic Recovery Dashboard that is still regularly being updated to help people understand the economy. But what I realized during that time is 
government was coming to us to ask for data. We have been providing data resources to planning committee, to other folks for a long time, but sometimes it feels a little bit like, hey, call on me, call on me, we have data, we can give it to you. Uh, and this felt very different. There was this real demand for the information, folks coming to us looking for resources that they really hadn't before, uh, particularly about business, the workforce and economy. So I hypothesized that the demand for timely data on the economy, businesses and the workforce grew throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And this hypothesis, maybe it's obvious to some, but it, I didn't realize um, how much demand there would be and what resources we had available to meet that demand. And I'm gonna talk about several of those resources and how, how effective some are at meeting that demand and not so much others. Uh, but that demand for data just really grew. Um, and I think we saw this like in the business sector itself, right? That need for business analytics grew, but that need for government, um, government informed data grew as well. The next couple slides are by no means confirmatory research, but sometimes if I have an idea, I wanna see if it pans out uh, in other places. So I just did a couple quick things to see if other folks were also seeing this demand. Uh, so I pulled down the PDF of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, and I just did a quick uh, find for the term evidence base. And it shows up 11 times. Maybe that's a lot, maybe, maybe it's not. Went back and compared it to the CARES Act. So in the, during the Trump administration, shows up four times. And go all the way back to the American Recovery and Investment Act, and it only said evidence-based once. Again, not confirmatory research by any means, but I think it's interesting uh, that there has been this growth in the concept of let's, let's provide resources in an evidence-based manner. Let's provide policy to respond to this pandemic in an evidence-based manner. Go ahead, if, if you think that means anything, I'm interested to see. This is also just a quick screenshot of a Google Trends. They had a whole Google Trends site set up for the US economy and COVID-19. That to me again, suggests this was something people were looking for information on in a way they hadn't before. Of course, COVID-19 is not something we've all experienced before, um, but what it was gonna do to the economy, those questions early on, uh, it was concerning. It was concerning and it wasn't like anything we had seen before and we knew it was going to have a large effect, but we didn't know exactly what. And as a result, you don't know exactly how to respond to it. This is just search terms for recession. Uh, so I believe demand grew for this kind of data. And as the Center for Public Affairs Research, we always want to respond to that demand for resources. We do, in the American Community Survey, for example, have a fair amount of workforce data. We also have some products for business data that I'm gonna talk about next. Um, and so yeah, jump to using these resources to answer some of the questions we had, but did find they didn't answer everything we were being asked. First one here is this, Small Business Pulse Survey, there's also a household survey. Notably, this is an experimental product from the United States Census Bureau, along with two others, monthly state retail sales and state sales tax collection. I think that's also another indicator uh, that other folks were seeing this demand for data during COVID-19. It is weekly. Uh, we were, David and I were on a um, workshop the other day with some Census Bureau folks, and they said it is gonna keep going for another little bit, but they will have to uh, continue to see how long it goes, but a weekly product exploring what's going on in the business sector, revenue, personnel, operations, very similar questions to the business survey we write here in Nebraska. Uh, they do have an interactive dashboard and some data downloads. Because that data is a fairly small sample coming out weekly, 
there's a little delay on the data. Um, and you can also really only speak for sort of Nebraska businesses as a whole, not too much um, segmenting or subpopulation searches in there. Household poll survey, also really interesting, but not focused just on business, more workforce. There is the longitudinal employer household dynamics quarterly since 2015. Lots of folks use this. Um, I use this fairly often. Uh, data supported state, counties, metros, a little bit more limited data at the county level, especially in a very rural state like Nebraska. Um, lots of online application tools for this. Census Bureau partners with some other folks to make those available. I'll show a quick screenshot of what you can do on there. And then the business formation statistics also from the United States Census Bureau. Monthly, there are weekly summaries, but um, at, again, less data reported. Um, and that looks at births and deaths of businesses. So there are some things to answer these kind of big economic questions we were getting. And I encourage all of you to search out these applications and use them if this is a topic of interest to you. So here's that small business survey. Uh, you can go in, select the week, select the question, and you can see that state comparison map, Nebraska. I'm gonna say this several times during uh, this presentation, but the impact of COVID-19 on Nebraska's economy was lesser here than many other states. And we'll try to get at why that is as well. Longitudinal employer household dynamics. This is the QWI Explorer, one of several um, applications that you can jump on and look at data. I use this a lot for looking at the size of businesses. We work sometimes with the Nebraska Business Development Center and they're very interested in who are our small businesses and you can get at that here. Um, but same thing, you go in, you select your geography, you select your indicator and you can see, um, you can see it broke down a couple different ways, not a ton. Business formation statistics, another screenshot from the United States Census Bureau. This is showing the change in the number of businesses by county, which is really great. Not a lot of products um, after the American Community Survey that you can get at the county level. And you can do that, but not a lot of different indicators. This is just some of that exam an example of that work we've done with the Nebraska Business Development Center using uh, those last two census resources. Um, so you can really answer some business questions. But man, the questions were coming in fast and they were coming in different than we've normally than we normally see. And so that's what sort of led me to look at the current population survey, look at what is available to folks and see if it could help answer some of those questions. Um, current population survey, it's a United States Census Bureau and the US Bureau of Labor Statistics together. Interestingly, uh, originally born with a slightly different name in 1930, so coming out of the Great Depression. Great Depression. So I think this demand for economic data is driven by what's going on in the economy, obviously, and these survey products are really important to answering this question. It's a monthly survey. Uh, American Community Survey goes on monthly, but doesn't report data monthly. So that's gonna be a big difference here. And especially when we're trying to see that change over time, that change through the pandemic, monthly surveys are really important to us. Of about 65,000 households, uh, I'm gonna explain how that works, but there's more cases than actual unique households surveyed. Um, that sample is smaller than the American Community Survey. It is smaller here in Nebraska as well. So there's less data, uh, but it answers a lot of questions the American Community Survey does not. Um, focus here is employment, unemployment, components of income. It is the official survey used to develop the unemployment rate. Employment rate, they actually use a slightly different product along with the current population survey, but it is really important for understanding unemployment and we'll see that in a couple of different ways. Um, uh, it is uh, interview based. Uh, and that's how they get that rich data that we're gonna see. There are some downloads. 
uh, you can go to the current population survey page from the Euro US Bureau of Labor or from the Census Bureau. You can download some data. There are some interactives to work with it, uh, but the best way is to get this IPUMS microdata. So I wanna pause for a second um, and talk about microdata. Uh, it's something we've said a couple times today, and if you've ever worked with CPAR, we might have said it to you. So I want to make you comfortable with this concept. As you saw this morning in Pauline's presentation, the Census Bureau very thoughtfully creates these tables, uh, summary tables essentially, with the American Community Survey data, sometimes pulling in that decennial date census data. And so they're saying, here's the categories of things people are interested in, a lot like what CPAR will do with our interactives. And let's make that quick, easily available for you to find. But very often folks wanna look at some subpopulations or cross tabulations, uh, even do some multivariate analysis with data. And in that case, you really can't use those summaries of the data, you need this micro data. And that is, essentially, you know, ID and how each individual or household responds to the survey on all of these factors. Of course, when you download this data, it is super secure. I cannot identify who um, completed the surveys by any means. I just have like a household ID or something like that. Uh, microdata is available for American Community Survey, Current Population Survey, uh, from this IPM so source, uh, some other national surveys as well. I encourage folks to think about microdata when they're making, uh, when they're asking research questions, but I will caution that it is certainly not as easy to use as data.census.gov or other interact summary interactives, aggregate interactives. Uh, you have to have uh, some a statistical program. So the IPMS microdata comes for SPSS, STATA, SAS, and R. I use STATA, that's what I learned. Uh, R is the cool one now, I'm working on it. Uh, and they do a couple things to make that data a little bit easier to use, but it is also a very large data set. Uh, I have, I think, 19 million IDs in the data set I pulled for this analysis. I showed you a minuscule amount of that, um, but it did take a long time to get onto my computer and then to read in uh, the coding that makes it a little bit easier to work with, but you still have to know a lot of tips and tricks. You still have to know the code book a little bit. Uh, certainly have to be able to make some assessments about margin of error and things that you uh, feel comfortable showing. Uh, as you continue to segment and, uh, the population you're looking at or subpopulations that you're examining, you're, the margins of errors are gonna go up as the sample goes down. So I, yeah, I'm excited about showing people microdata and working with microdata for folks. And you can reach out and talk to us about that um, if you're not comfortable using it yourself. But uh, I think a lot of our data users are becoming more advanced and may wanna do that. So just wanted to share that tip and trick. CPS surveys civilian non-institutionalized households. That is a little different from the American Community Survey. They'll have some group quarters estimates and they use a rotating panel design. It's real easy. So they're gonna choose a group of households and the and that'll be a cohort and they're gonna interview them consecutively for four months. That's really cool because you can do some longitudinal analysis there. Then that group comes out for eight months. Thanks for leaving me alone. <laughs> and then they come back for an additional four months before they go out. So you can see in this picture, and it's just a screenshot from IPUMS, that A1, A2, that's a cohort. They're on for those four weeks, out for eight, back in for four. So you can do longitudinal analysis, which you cannot do with the American Community Survey here, but you can also do cross-sectional analysis, just looking month to month at what's going on, because you have a full panel within every any month, which you can see there. So January would include folks from the year before as well. They also use a propor proportional strat stratified sampling design. 
this is kind of important when you're talking about a rural state like Nebraska. So stratified sampling means you dice up the state into or the area you're looking at into strata. And then you're gonna pull a sample. So you're gonna ask a group of folks within that strata to take the survey and you're gonna estimate that number that needs to take the survey based on the population as well as some other uh, demographic characteristics in the current population survey. What does that mean? About 40% of the households in the current population survey are from the Omaha Council Bluffs Metro. Metro is a little bit larger than just Douglas or Sarpy County. Uh, well, that's kind of proportional to what's going on in the state. So it is a good sample. It does speak to Nebraska, but I'm not gonna go in and pick counties and try to report data for counties like we would do with the American Community Survey. It's really not representative of um, all smaller locations. I think I would be very comfortable uh, just you know, reporting for the Metro here, uh, especially if I was using multiple years, but in any one year, I'm gonna speak about Nebraska, I'm gonna speak about the Omaha Council Bluffs Metro, but I'm not gonna be able to segment um, the way you can, segment geographically the way you can with the American Community Survey. Uh, I did check some of the numbers I pulled here that, that were comparable to some American Community Survey numbers. They were surprisingly close when you're talking about Nebraska as a whole. So let's jump in and see what this tool can do for us. Really importantly, in May of 2020, so, you know, already into the pandemic, they added four questions. And that's actually not common, but thank you current population survey folks for responding to what was an unprecedented event. So uh, we're gonna look at four questions to begin. We're gonna compare Nebraska's rates to the United States. And these are all about employment and COVID. Smaller percentage of Nebraskans were unable to work due to the COVID-19 pandemic compared to the nation. You can see about 12% of Nebraskans in May were unable to work, well, 14.4% to the US. Again, you are gonna see that Nebraska fares well uh, in a lot of these employment out survey outcomes. And we can talk about why that is in a little bit. Uh, you do see another trend that you'll see throughout this presentation, the height of the pandemic. The height of the pandemic really is for Nebraska, starts in March, April, May, June, or uh, some of the worst months for employment here in Nebraska. But that trend does dip down over time. And so ending in December 2020, there is data for January and February of 2021 in the current population survey that I will show. Smaller percentage of Nebraskans were prevented from looking for work due to COVID-19. And those quotes are exact text from the survey questions. Notice these numbers are much smaller at all. Great news. Folks could get out there and find work during the COVID-19, but absolutely some. We're gonna dig in on prevent it a little bit later. Percent of Nebraskans who receive pay for hours not worked due to COVID-19, pretty close to the national rate. I think that's kind of interesting. So at the height of the pandemic, about 3% um, received pay, even if they weren't working and that has dropped off pretty significantly over time. I just wanna track in here. These are those paycheck protection programs, two rounds. Melanie mentioned them a little bit earlier. Um, so that first round one, and that was sort of the big one a lot of folks knew about, most of that money was out by April. So there you go. In May, folks are keeping folks on the payroll, even if they're not working. And I can back that up in those COVID business surveys. That was number one thing that business owners wanted to do here in Nebraska. I don't know about everywhere else, although tracks pretty similarly, but there was a real call to make sure folks stayed on the payroll. It dropped off drastically as that program was used up. We also know um, there was a lot of questions there early on with how much of it was gonna have to be paid back 
was it loans or grants, et cetera. And so, yeah, that stimulus had an impact, but it was not long lasting. And then again, most of the money for round two was out in August and you saw a little bump there, but it doesn't last long. Again, not a ton of people in the group at all, um, but certainly an important uh, exercise in protecting our workforce. In this question, we are being asked about remote work a lot. I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about this question. I think I have like four slides related to it. So bear with me. Uh, the direct question, did you work remotely for pay due to COVID-19? And that Nebraska line looks pretty similar to the US rate. So starting at 15.9, so about 16% of folks by May were working remotely. I was surprised it wasn't higher. If you were to throw it in the Q&A or the chat, I'm interested to hear. Um, there is some questions in the current population survey that looks at telework, that looked at telework before, and US rates were around 25% of folks that worked telework sometimes. So this is specifically totally worked remotely for pay due to COVID-19. Uh, so I, you know, I wonder if folks um, that were already teleworking obviously are not sort of in this group and that's some of the discrepancy. Uh, but they're it, interesting, right? I think if we think back to May, work remote was all we were talking about. And we'll dig into maybe why that's not as high as I thought at least. Uh, we do see it trend down pretty consistently into the fall. This could be a little blip. Um, rates did go back up again in October uh, after a pretty scary summer. We you know, uh, got a little colder, rates came back up and we're right here around the US rate of 10.5% of folks still working remotely due to COVID. I wanted to talk in this about Nebraska household with one child or more. Um, as someone who worked remotely, still is, I am in my basement. Uh, throughout the pandemic, I think uh, we were all um, challenged because of schools being out as well. So I made this and you will see that those with children, one or more, were more likely than just the regular Nebraska rate to be to work from home that has more to do with the occupation mix of our more established families, which we'll see that as well. Uh, but oh, good, you know, 30% of folks, that's my guess if I was gonna apply the percentage to the estimate of households with children, which I don't like to do with the current population survey and more like to just report those percentages, but you know, 100,000 ish households that are able to work remote while those kids are home. Still lots of folks that I have no idea what they were doing. And then I was like, ooh, let me be really interesting here and layer on when uh, schools were schools were out. So I used Omaha Public Schools as my benchmark. Well, I'm a little silly sometimes. So Omaha Public Schools went home in March of 2020. So by May, clearly they're out. They're out till August, but oh wait, when they didn't come back in August, they were still out till December. Omaha Public Schools didn't come back till February. So not a particularly exciting analysis, but a real reminder of how many households were unbelievably um, challenged and had difficult circumstances um, and you know, pain on their economic opportunity throughout the pandemic. Dave, I'll let you interrupt in one second. But despite that pain, there were kids in masks. That's Rex who started kindergarten in the pandemic and Liv and I walking home from dropping him off on the, dropping him off on the first day. We did find a daycare for her though. <laughs> Go ahead, Dave. Just wanted to uh, mention that, just put it into the chat of whether people thought that those work from home numbers were high or low. And, and everybody who's responded thought that they're very low. And, and some thought it might be up you know, 40%, uh, you know, in, in that range. So that's consistent across what our panel or our participants have uh, experienced. Yeah, so this is really cool. 
in about one slide, I'm going to show something that I think really helped me to understand that, that I don't know that we're all, we were all thinking about. We kind of just thought everyone went remote, right? Not so much. So let's see one more. I uh, had a media question even this week that asked, is remote here to stay? And I said, I don't think so. Uh, so I just layered in January and February of 2021 here, and you will see that the rate is kind of down and leveling off, but we're really only talking about 8% of folks that are still um, working remotely as a result of COVID-19. So again, this is interesting, and I wanted to understand um, why it wasn't as high as I thought it would be. And I had an inkling of where I'd find the answer. Everyone take a deep breath, myself included. This is a complicated uh, little chart, but it's gonna do a lot of work for us. So let me walk you through it. Over here on the vertical axis, we have median personal income, okay? Higher is better. I like to think as incomes go up, we get a little happier, right? And then uh, across our horizontal axis, we have percent of folks employed. Then the size of the bubble is the answer to the question, did you work remotely? And the actual bubbles themselves are a range of industries. Uh, if I grumbled at anybody over the past couple weeks, it was because as much as the IPUMS microdata makes it easy to work with this, they wanna give you all of the industry classifications you could ever possibly want uh, so that you can make choices. But uh, if I mapped uh, things like 92 of them, it would look really messy. So I spent a lot of time trying to collapse these in a thoughtful way. Uh, the American Community Survey um, industry classifications, they do that for you. Um, but they collapse them a little bit differently than I did here. Okay, so median personal income, percent employed. So above the line is above the median income of around 40,000, which is what the current population survey reports it. And you will notice that above the red line, all the bubbles are bigger. Above the red line, so those industries that folks work that pay more, we're more likely to work remote. I'm gonna say it again, maybe you're, I think you probably have it by now. Maybe some of you already knew this, but I think it explains a lot about what has happened here in Nebraska to our economy during COVID-19. Those industries that already, folks worked in that already paid above the median personal income, they were more likely to go remote. Those lower wage jobs were less likely to go remote. It's so kind of in those higher wage jobs. Yeah, there was a week there where we were all like, oh, I don't know where my computer is. I need a new cord. But once we got set up and we're working remotely, it was life as normal. Those lower wage jobs are where um, the pain of the COVID-19 pandemic was born. Dave, you have a question? Yeah, just to clarify, um, these data, are they for Nebraska or for the U.S.? This is just for Nebraska. Thank you. This is just for Nebraska here. Okay. Um, the U.S. economy, where the bubbles lay out is a little bit differently, is, is different. Um, so we're just focusing here on Nebraska. So there's whole sectors that can't work remote, and you're not going to be surprised about what those are accommodation and food service, construction, healthcare and social assistance, um, some of these administrative support positions. Uh, well, it's a little bit bigger. Transportation and warehousing, manufacturing, but those don't work remote. And that makes complete sense to me now, um, but there are you know, lots of folks in manufacturing that can't work remote. Uh, there's lots of folks in Nebraska that work in retail trade that couldn't go remote in the same way someone like myself can, someone in finance and insurance. Education did this time, but who knows? Who knows about next time? So those higher wage jobs transitioned through the COVID economy much more 
easily, much more seamlessly. There's less loss of job, which we'll see soon as well in those higher wage jobs compared to those lower wage jobs. And that's stabilized Nebraska's economy, that we have as many folks as we do working in those high wage industries that transition to remote that kept, we see those differentials sometimes with Nebraska versus the US of that impact, that economic impact, and that's it. Our economy, our economic mix, our industry mix is such that it's stabilized, that it stayed stable. But the pain of this pandemic was borne by the low wage workers. So already low wage just got lower. We'll see that. Just wanna throw uh, this one up. This is, I did a while back using American Community Survey data uh, and it, so, and I break them into these four segments and it matches um, where it's apples to apples comparisons pretty well. The next thing that I really wanted to explore that you would not be surprised I wanted to explore based on what we've learned this year uh, was unemployment and employment. And not just, are you unemployed or are you employed, but why? And the current population survey compared again here to the American Community Survey has about three or four questions on employment and unemployment for every one American Community Survey. So this is again, just a quick stream screenshot um, comparing the ACS to the CPS. So you can see the level of detail on that employment and unemployment factors that the American Community Survey does not have. This is gonna be an important chart I'll come back to. We're gonna go into depth in almost every one of these categories. 61 point, and this is for Nebraska specifically and it's for 2020. Um, and I bound it. Again, I could go into 2021, I could go back to 2019, but I set the data to only pull for 2020 here. 61.3%, usually higher, we'll see that over time, are at work. And I'll break down those segments if they're full-time and part-time. Then we have not in the labor force. So why are you not in the labor force? We're gonna be able to answer here, 11% of the population. Not in the labor force because you're unable to work. 4% has job, but not at work last week. <laughs> so funny that they even asked this, but I'll tell you exactly why folks were not at work and it is different during 2020 than normal. Uh, percent in armed forces and then, oh, so unemployed experienced workers. So this is someone that has been in the workforce before and are now unemployed and then unemployed new worker, maybe someone coming out of school that's looking for a job, but hasn't found one yet. So much depth here. Wanna start focusing on at work first. This is the percent of Nebraskans at work and you can see it by year. So going back to 2010, I could go back to 1962. I'm not a historian, I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> um, and you can see the trend up and you can actually see the trend down. Nebraska was sort of a little delayed, um, but certainly not big in its impact from the Great Recession. It was pretty strong there early on and it got um, kind of leveled out. Uh, coming in to COVID-19, we had one of the strongest economies in the US for sure that we've had in a while as was true in Nebraska. And there's that dip in 2020. Not outrageous, which we know, certainly lesser than compared to the US. Here it is by month. Uh, in 2020. So month in 2020, starting in January, this data is asked every month. So those COVID questions, we just started in May. This goes back to first month of 2020. There's that strong economy. And man, that was a fall. Uh, that was a fall. But gradually coming um, into the summer, it strengthened, but certainly not at pre-pandemic levels. And I will say that it is we're not we're not back i think the trajectory is right it did stall i think there was um in the fall like will we get a vaccine will we be able to work remotely long term um so lots of questions um but it continues to strengthen but early on everyone said oh it's going to be a v-shape right as fast as it goes down everything will come back that is not a v-shape Kind of like a weird check mark. 
Um, I will note the first stimulus direct payments came at a really good time. It was absolutely a low point. Nebraska Economic Recovery Dashboard, we did a couple of things with the components of personal income to just show how important that timing there was. So over here, I have that first graph that I showed you. I'm gonna go into each of these classifications. So of those 61.3% of folks that are at work, the majority of them are full-time. 23.2% uh, are part-time. They ask so many questions about employment in this survey, obviously. Um, and I think I have like three categories combined here. So full-time, but used to be part-time and full-time, but may go down to part-time. And then same for part-time. I think there's four categories here. But the bulk of Nebraska's that are at work are at full-time. I think I wanna talk about part-time first though. Um, so we get questions about underemployment all the time, and we cannot explore that with the American Community Survey or Decennial Census or anything like that. Current population survey is where we would be able to answer those questions. And we got underemployment questions before COVID-19 pandemic, and we definitely got them during the pandemic. So this question asks, hey, why are you part-time? And not that part-time is bad, but we'd love to know. So the majority, and that was like 23%, right? The majority of that population that is part-time is part-time because of they're in school or training or other family personal obligations. They like the time off. Can I go part-time? But here's where we get at underemployment. So slack work, business conditions, full-time, but you know, it's a full-time job, but you don't get the hours you need. Um, but only find part-time work, those are our underemployed folks. So it's a fairly small percentage of the already small percentage that are part-time, but that's who's underemployed. So slack work means um, uh, that's the best I could kind of do. Um, the business conditions don't let me work more um, or can only find that part-time. So Yes, we do have some underemployed folks in Nebraska. And like I said, I get asked that all the time. I never had an answer, but now I can put a number on it if you needed it. Next, we're gonna go back. There's those two categories of unemployed, unemployed experienced worker and unemployed new worker. And these are the reasons why someone is unemployed. Also interesting. So in 2020, the largest reason that folks were uh, unemployed was due to layoffs. That is not typically the reason why folks are unemployed in Nebraska. Uh, I'll go through the other categories, then I'll give you a second. You can guess what you think it is, and then I'll tell you what it is. So layoffs. Then we have this category, other job loser. Um, that's for the folks that don't have a good chance of returning to their employer, which is a nice way of saying terminated. Uh, we have re-entrant, uh, someone that was in the labor force, was out for some period of time, and now is looking for work again. And uh, I hope I say this right, but unemployed means you were looking for work in the last four weeks, but do not have the job, a job. You, can be, you can't be part-time and unemployed, though. You would be part-time and slack work. We have job leavers, folks that are moving on to try something else but haven't quite found it yet. We have those that are in temporary jobs that have ended. And then that smallest category is new entrants. So folks that are looking for to join the labor force for the first time. So largest category in 2020 is job loser. That is not usually the largest category. I will show that in a little bit. I'll give you a second to guess you can, uh, what you think the largest category um, going back to 2010 is starting in before 2020. I don't have a ton of time, so it's re-entrant. It's re-entrant. So folks that have left the labor force for some period of time and are now looking to rejoin. And I think that's um, kind of interesting as well. But this year it was layoffs. Let's look at it a little more. So we're going back month in 2020, starting in January, and you can see that big spike, as we know, um, coming uh, in layoffs, matching, uh, driving unemployment for sure. Certainly not as high as other states. I just have a note here, Nevada, for instance, 
29% uh, unemployment rate. So there's that. I wanted to look at this again. It's actually a slightly less complicated map, um, but not too much. Here I have on that vertical axis, um, access percent of persons unemployed in 2020. So here higher is worse. Here higher is worse. And then the same horizontal access percent of workers employed. Uh, you can see those jobs and I should layer in the bubble as median income. I'll probably do that for my next presentation. Those are those low wage jobs back to those other ones. And that's where people got laid off while the people do not get laid off in those exact jobs that you could work remote and were already uh, good paying jobs. So layoffs being the driver and we know exactly where those layoffs were. I put the red line here at 4% of folks going unemployed in 2020 by those industries. Uh, that's actually pretty high for Nebraska. You could bring it down, um, but you can see where the layoffs happened. Then we go to has job, but not at work last week. So absent. Um, why are folks absent? Vacation and personal days, others. Uh, this one, own illness, injury, medical problems. You would not be surprised. Uh, that number went well, went way up in 2020. So folks um, either uh, in that category, having COVID themselves um, or taking care of folks that had COVID. Why not looking for work? This is another category we get asked about a lot. So we have this really high labor force participation rate in Nebraska, um, but some people choose not to be in the labor force. And so we ask why? Uh, we need everybody working here in Nebraska. Um, so this gets at that. And again, no other resource I know of would be able to answer this. So these are the folks that are not in the labor force. <laughs> Why are they not in the labor force? That's 11% of these um, households. So a fair chunk. So that first other, please specify, those are the folks that just choose not to be in there. The rest in school or other training, that's fine. Family responsibilities, well, you know, we could probably support them to get in the labor force, but I can't promise you that. But down here, this is a group you will hear either discouraged workers or marginally attached workers. These, this category of folks is something um, we look at nationally. If you ever hear, you know, the unemployment rate is this, but it's probably a lot higher. Here's we're what we're talking about. So these are folks that are not actively looking for work. If they were, they'd be in the unemployed category. But for some reason, they choose not to be in the labor force and maybe it's not for good reason, it's because they feel discouraged from being in the workforce. And it is um, an extremely interesting phenomena to look at by industry, by uh, lots of different, uh, by other demographics, something I'm interested in doing in the first place. Who are these discouraged workers and why are they discouraged? Um, couldn't find work, they feel some ageism, uh, they can't get to work. They don't have the skills and training. We're talking a lot about workforce development in the state. So things like that. I'm going to rush through these last two slides. We commonly get how many people have multiple jobs. You would have to use the current population survey to get that. It's about 7% of those that are uh, at work are at work at multiple jobs. Uh, the way they classify that, if you go over 35 hours a week, even if it's at two jobs, you go into the full-time category, uh, we could break that down so that we, I could tell you the number of people that are sort of putting together multiple jobs to get into that full-time category, but didn't do it here. Another really interesting thing in the current population survey is the fact that they get at lots of different measures and components of income. Here I just report median income uh, for some of them, but I can do dividends, interest, welfare payments, transfer government subsidies, uh, social security income, retirement income. Um, we know, just like we know a lot more about employment and unemployment from the current population survey, we know a lot more about income components as well. We don't have much time, but I wanna answer every possible question I can, and I appreciate your time and attention.
Yeah, Josie, we had a couple uh, come in. And uh, uh, one, one of the things uh, was interesting for folks uh, in that multiple job holders, uh, is there a, a national comparison? I mean, did you, did you run the Nebraska was at 7%? Did, did you run the US number on that? I, so I, I don't think for that particular one I did, but we absolutely can. And if that's of interest, I'll make sure to grab it for folks. Because uh, generally we rank really high in multiple job holders, so so we should be above U.S. average, and, and now we can um, go detail that a little more um, specifically. There were a couple other questions, and both related to the um, bubble graphs. So you know, if you want to um, move to those, they're roughly about slide twenty-five or so. Um, and let me pull up the question. So it it says, um, why do you think there's a relationship between lower paying jobs? and not being able to work from home. Okay, so that, that was the general question she goes on to ask. It, do you think it might have to do with education level or do you have other insights as well? Sure, so, right, it's one thing to say low wage jobs were more likely not to be remote, but that really doesn't provide you the level of context that, for instance, this slide does. So, accommodation and food service. I think everyone can understand why that didn't translate well to remote. Yes, we had takeout. Gosh, did we have takeout at my house? So yes, we have, um, we can supplant it, but it's certainly not at the same level of service as going in. And so you couldn't take servers home with you. Uh, you couldn't take the chef home with you. And so that doesn't work in a remote environment. So that context there, construction, agriculture, you can't take those remote. But those have always been low wage jobs uh, and they're low wage jobs other places as well. That's not specific to us. So it's not that low wage jobs can't go remote. Uh, it's that most of the low wage jobs in Nebraska were not the type of jobs that you could take remote. And I think the important thing there is that's what helped our economy stay so strong. We don't have a ton of folks like Nevada that have people working in accommodation and food service. That's, that hurts the economy when you have lots of folks working in that particular low wage job because it doesn't translate to the remote environment, but that's not really the Nebraska economy. So it's not that low wage jobs can't go remote, it just happens that many of the jobs that are low wage also couldn't go remote, if that makes sense. Sure, and here's kind of a, another question that's related. It, it asked, what about some of the ways that the different sectors, uh, or that some sectors affected other sectors? You know, so for instance, sectors that might have low wages may also need childcare, which in turn increases the need for childcare workers who couldn't be remote, you know. So any, any thoughts on the interconnectedness between sectors and the, and the needs that they have? Sure. So unbelievably interconnected, and that's why I pulled uh, that slide of not just work remote, but you have kids and you can't work remote. That's really important too. The econ so economy means relationships. Um, the economy isn't a single sector. It is the way that all of the sectors work together. Um, so any one sector having this kind of unemployment, um, having the layoffs that we clearly saw has a ripple effect. That's for sure. The ripple effect was lesser because those high wage jobs, and I think the stat is like one doctor, for instance, creates like 16 other jobs. So they were still using those other sectors even if it wasn't as great. So the ripple effect is absolutely there. The childcare component of this whole story is absolutely there. Uh, it's just not as bad as we thought. And a lot of folks are starting to compare the COVID-19 recession to the Great Recession. And they were very different uh, because sort of there's, there was a more universal economic impact in the Great Recession than we saw here. And that's just that those remote jobs 
stabilized us uh, much more so, but the hurt was definitely still there. And gosh knows the sort of social and behavioral impact of COVID-19 was pretty great as well. Yeah, yeah, relative to the Great Recession, for sure. So we, we had a, another question come in just now, um, relates to something I think a lot of people might want to hear more about, and that is if there are any numbers about working in the gig economy. You know, we hear that from time to time, and this person lists a specific example of a person that they know that's not employed at a single place for more than a week or two. You know, so they're, they're bouncing around from, from position to position. So thoughts on that? The current population survey is what's gonna get us there. Didn't go into it here, obviously, didn't have even as much time as I thought, um, but it helps, we can kind of identify temporary workers in a way we can't with other survey products, national survey products, state survey products. So we can look at those temporary works. There's specific questions about being a consultant and or, um, being self-employed and coming in and out of the labor force based on projects, why you left projects. There, there are a lot of questions that can help us to get at the gig economy, which I know is a like underemployment, like um, disadvantaged workers, like multiple job holders, it comes up a lot. And that's why I was so excited to grab uh, and you know, not an expert at the current population survey at all. And there are experts, um, but realizing that this could really help answer a lot of questions that folks have about Nebraska's economy. So, you know, those questions I didn't answer today, I have the data set already now, <laughs> just send them and I'm happy to answer them. Sure. And that leads right into kind of our closing question, which is, you know, what other topics are you interested in exploring on the CPS as we move forward? Thanks. I am... I am a researcher at heart. I never go into a data set looking to answer a specific question. I'm just, I get so excited by all the other things I can do. Um, so really look, I want to look at the demographics of folks that are in those high wage versus low wage jobs. I am very interested in the racial, ethnic and gender wage gaps. And you can look at that with American Community Survey, but you can get at the why they exist with the current population survey. And I can't wait to explore that. I will a little bit more in June along with uh, my friend at the Women's Fund. Um, poverty is in here. So you don't have to wait for the American Community Survey to get poverty. It's not as bad as you think. Um, I, I won't go into it, but I think there's a lot to look at there. Um, but in any one, oh my gosh, right here. So those underemployed folks, what are the demographics of them? What are the racial and ethnic breakdowns? I'm interested in understanding if the economy is working for everyone. And I think I can do that uh, with this particular survey product.